Hi there, I'm Dr. Nate Story from Bright Agritech, and this is Aquaponics Academy episode number eight. This will be the first part of a podcast discussing the fundamentals of system design. So today we're going to talk about what needs you have for your aquaponic system, or even your hydroponic system, how you can fulfill these needs, and um, my ideas on system design and what we here at Bright Agritech think is important when it comes to aquaponic system designs. So um, as a caveat, a lot of what I say here is just my own personal design theory, and um, a lot of it is focused on problem solving, and specifically problem solving uh, things that we've run across when we're designing systems to be resilient, easy to use, um, and most importantly, uh, appropriate to the market. So uh, take it with a grain of salt. It's just my own personal design theory. There are a lot of people out there that completely disagree with me and have really good reasons for doing so. So um, this is, you know, this is my personal take on on how to design systems to, to meet your needs. Welcome to Aquaponics Academy, a bright agrotech podcast designed to help you overcome common aquaponic issues, learn new growing techniques, and help you be as successful as you can be as an aquaponic practitioner. Join aquaponics expert, Dr. Nate Story, the creator of Zip Throw Towers, as he breaks down complex topics into easy to understand information. And now, here's Dr. Nate Story. Before we really get into um, the nuts and bolts of designing your system, you have to start off by recognizing a need. So you have to understand what the need for the system is. Why are you building your system in the first place? And uh, this could be, you know, to grow vegetables. It could be to grow fish. Now, if it's mostly to grow fish and not necessarily grow vegetables, then that tells you something about the system you should be designing, right? It should be very fish-centric. Now, if your goal are to, is to grow a lot of vegetables, then it should be more plant-centric. It's, if it's just to grow the most amount of food uh, for the lowest cost, then I'll tell you right now, it's probably going to be pretty plant-centric as well. So um, understand why you want to build the system in the first place. It could be for markets. It could be for your family. It could just be for fun. Uh, you'd be amazed at how many people just want basically a koi pond that grows them some vegetables. And, uh, you know, if that's your goal, then that dictates a very different system than the system you would build if you wanted to, um, say, you know, grow out uh, trout for sale at local markets. So that's just something to keep in mind and um, something to be thinking about from the start. And I always say, instead of just taking someone else's plans for your system, what you want to do is you want to take um, the design elements, the guides that they provide you in those plans, and you want to tailor your system to your needs. So um, let, me, let me be clear here on this point. Um, there's a lot of people who are absolutely convinced they know better than anyone else exactly how to design and build systems. And they may very well uh, know better than everyone else. But um, it's always important for you to evaluate your unique circumstances, your particular market, your unique needs and desires um, when you're figuring on a design. So um, keep that in mind. It's really, really important. So once you recognize the need, you need to fill, figure out how you fulfill this need. And this is, you know, this goes hand in hand with the first question. Pretty much as soon as you recognize what the need is and answer that question, you understand how to fulfill this need. So building a fish-centric system, you know, you want to build trout, you want to have a system that, say, grows trout out for for market. So you have to have water that's really high quality. Um, it limits kind of the, the system designs that you can use. And um, it, it means that most likely um, you're dealing with a system that it's probably a two pump system or, or a very simplified single pump system. You have to sacrifice some elements. Um, and you have to keep that water quality very high. You have to keep, keep your temperatures fairly low. And, um, you know, most likely in a system that's growing trout, you're going to have more of a fish-centric focus because they are your babies. They're the expensive part of the system. And your system is designed to keep those fish alive, not necessarily to grow marvelous produce, right? Uh, trout are a very high-dollar fish. So, um, you know, it's, it's the kind of thing where you're very focused on those fish. Now, if your goal is to grow a lot of produce and, uh, you know, you want to grow tilapia, then that changes things. You can switch over to poor water quality. You can simplify your design, make it a little bit more foolproof. And uh, you can get great numbers both on fish production and on your veggies that way. So um, figure out how you're going to fulfill that need. Now, um, 
I will say there are a lot of designs out there, and there's a lot of absolutely marvelous designs out there. There's a lot of really smart people in the aquaponics community. They've been doing work for a really long time on everything from solids lifting overflows to bell siphon design to um, timers and and, uh, automation equipment. You name it. Um, There's someone that's been playing with it and working on it and absolutely has some great ideas, has, has worked a lot of the bugs out of um, all these little uh, subsystems. So make use of the community. Make use of all of the brilliant people out there that have ber- been working on this stuff for a really long time. But also, you know, be open-minded and play nice and, um, you know, make sure that you're not um, imposing. Make sure that you're you're considering all viewpoints and you're not taking everything that's thrown out there as, 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 uh, God's truth. It's just, it, some things, some things are, are valid. Some things are not so valid. So just be, uh, intelligent about who you're listening to and the claims that are being made and just, uh, make sure you're making your own decisions. Um, but you know, the, the end of all of that is just to say there's smart people out there doing great work. Make sure you take advantage of all the information that they're sharing so freely uh, when you're starting to think about the nuts and bolts of your design. Now, if you've listened to a lot of my other stuff, um, you know that I am, I love single pump systems. And um, anytime I can do a single pump system, I do a single pump system. You, uh, you know, I, I do two pump systems. I do multi-pump systems. Don't get me wrong. But I also... Um, In in those systems, I'm building a lot of fail-safes in. I'm building a lot of redundancy in. I have to basically invest in more equipment when I size up to multi-pump designs. So you know that I love single-pump designs. Everyone also knows that I love splitting my flow. So these are, you know, um, basically systems where we split our flow. We have water returning from fish. We have water returning from plants. I pump it up with a single pump. I split it, send a portion of it back to the fish and a portion of it back to the plants. Now, a lot of people really hate split flow. And they have, uh, you know, oftentimes very good and intelligent reasons for disliking it. Uh, One among them being, you know, sending back poor quality water to the fish. Now, most of the fish species we deal with um, are not just okay with poor water quality. They're, They're, you know, they're, they're very happy in it. So we use tilapia, of course, and um, they can tolerate a poor water quality, and they still are very happy fish. They feed voraciously. They're low stress. Uh, we have a fish die of old age a couple times a year out of hundreds and hundreds of fish. Most of our fish are very, very old, and uh, it kind of speaks to their health and their happiness. So, you know, split flow in that system design depends on using a fish like tilapia um, most of the time. Um, Either that or you have to turn over your water a lot faster. Um, So these these are things to think about. But you know that I love split flow. And I'm going to come back and I'm going to talk about all these in detail. I love operating all of my components under pressure. This is another thing. I don't like gravity feed um, from one subsystem to another. I like operating everything under pressure. I can use solenoids and computer systems to blow things out under pressure. I can um, time zones to come on and come off under pressure. I can do all sorts of wonderful things under pressure that it becomes much more difficult to do when you're just operating under gravity flow. Um, I also like low stocking densities. And again, there's a lot of very smart people out there who do not like low stocking densities. They feel that um, if, if these systems are to be economically viable, they have to have high fish stocking densities. Well, uh, my answer to that is always, you know, every situation is different. Some markets, uh, fish have almost no value, and the compliance issues involved with profit processing them are so high that um, it, it, it's just not profitable to do fish. But it is profitable to do plants. And so, you know, that that's something that we focus on in our system. And I will say as a caveat to that, you know, if I'm going to bring up markets and I'm going to talk about plants, there's a big question posed there between hydroponics and aquaponics, but I'll save that for a different podcast. Um, And everyone knows also that I really love um, high biological surface area systems. So this is front loading, 
all of our um, biological surface area, we're, we're lowering our overall system volume, increasing our, the, the biological system area of our system overall, and really being able to, to complete all of the little chemical processes we need to do in our system super, super quickly. And uh, you know, too, that this allows me to leave a lot of solids in my system and process them in the towers themselves. So um, let me go back through that list of things, and I'm going to talk about each one in detail and kind of explain why I love this particular element, element of the systems that we design and some alternatives to. Um, so the first one is a single pump system. So a single pump system is really nice because what it allows you to do is it allows you to uh, really minimize um, your losses if there is a failure. Um, and it reduces the chance of that failure happening. So the, the more parts you have moving at any given time, the more likely you are to have a breakdown, right? Assuming all of the qual parts are of, of similar quality. So if you have, you know, a, a several pumps going at once and the entire system is dependent on all of those pumps functioning together, when one of those pumps fails, the entire system fails, and um, this is a big deal because a lot of the time in, in two-pump systems, there's always the possibility if you don't design in the proper fail-safes that you can pump a lot of water out of your system. Um, you can kill fish. You can kill plants. There's all sorts of problems that can arise. And uh, now you can design around that. You can design around that. But for brand new beginning aquaponics folks, you're not always thinking about the worst case scenario and the things that can go wrong. So in two pump systems, um, if one pump fails, you can have a big mess on your hands. So this is one reason I love single pump systems. Now we know immediately when our pumps fail and we have a backup pump wired up, we basically drop it down. We've got quick connect collars on all of our pumps so we can take them out in a jiffy, slide a new pump in and plug it in and bam, we're rocking and rolling. So um, redundancy is important whether you're single pump or multi-pump, but always having backups, always having maybe uh, another pump plumbed in at any given time, even if it's not running, um, this is always smart. This is always smart. So you'll, you'll never um, regret having extras of all of these different components, whether it's a, a single pump or a multi-pump system. Now, the one reason that I love single pump systems is that it lowers my overall cost. I'm, I'm using less electricity. By and large, I can rely on larger, higher quality pumps to do all of the work in the system. And I get a little bit better efficiency that way. Um, but it also kind of uh, it, it lowers my costs, right? Instead of buying two pumps, now I buy one pump. And instead of uh, having to have someone checking that consistently, instead of investing in, in alarm equipment or alert equipment uh, for two pumps, now I just have to worry about one. And um, there's, there's all sorts of benefits there. Um, the, the chief one, though, being that rates of failure typically come down. Um, so if you're just running a single pump, the likelihood of that pump, you know, you know that pump is going to last you a couple of years. Most of the pumps we la use last us two to three years. And um, so kind of towards the end of that time span, you start keeping an eye on it. And the moment it goes or is starting to go, you can usually tell, pull it, replace it, and you're back in the saddle. Um, so it's a great... Um, it's great, kind of a great design philosophy that I certainly did not invent. I, I, adapt, I adopted it from a lot of other people who came before me, very smart people who, who uh, were running single pump systems for a very long time, um, probably before I was even born. So it's a great uh, design philosophy, and I always encourage people to consider it. Now, if you can't dig a sump, if you can't do a single pump system, then, um, you know, you have to go with the two-pump system. I will say that if you are using a two-pump system, make sure you are designing your system with the proper fail-safes. That is, make sure you have... Um, you know, float switches. We use float switches uh, to turn pumps on and off and make sure that we don't run pumps dry. We use float switches um, for this purpose. And oftentimes we have multiple pl pumps plumbed in um, on float switches that activate at different water levels. So um, that allows us to basically uh, make sure that we're not overflowing any kind of low 
really low shallow sumps that we're that we're using and uh, you'll see this design um, you know in a lot of our indoor systems that we put in you'll see this design in a lot of our customers systems who we help with uh, you know help with their system design and plumbing it's a it's kind of a, a nice way to try and cover up some of the faults that come with a, a two pump system or a lot of the risks so uh, think about fail safes think about ways that you can protect your system if you have to use multiple pumps um, if you have to put in a two pump system just install four pumps that's all there is to it have them activate at different water levels or on automation systems make sure that if one of your pump fails you always have a backup that can run um, in short order to prevent your system from overflowing or to prevent um, a problem from happening um, split flow so split flow is the second one uh, Split flow is uh, it's nice because it allows us to do single pump systems. It should almost be paired with that first design idea. And um, splitting our flows uh, with fish that will tolerate lower quality water um, can be a great tool for having a really efficient system and operating all of the elements in the system under pressure, eliminating that whole gravity feed element. So... We run our towers at ground level, and all of those towers drain into gutters and a pipe system that drains down to our sump tank. Similarly, we operate, uh, we, so we operate those towers under pressure, which is nice because we can actually blow out lines. Um, our fish operate under pressure too, so uh, we pressure, we use pressurized water, we, we you know, dump that into the fish tanks, we keep it highly aerobic, and we turn over a lot of water. We turn over our system uh, water at least twice an hour. And all of you guys know that um, I'm a big fan of turning over system volume a minimum of, of twice per hour when it's possible. Um, so, you know, we're able to basically completely filter around 75% of our total system volume once per hour which, you know, a lot of the folks that um, don't like the idea of split flows, their concern is that, you know, we're, we're just basically circulating all that fish waste in the water around and around and around. Um, but the reality is we use, kind of use this law of big numbers. You know, half of, uh, if, we're, if, we're, if our system volume is, is 4,000 gallons and um, we can pump 8,000 gallons an hour, um, then we can... At the, we're splitting that flow, you know, at the end of an hour, we've moved, um, you know, a significant amount of that water. And the math works in our favor. So if we turn the water over twice an hour, then at the end of an hour, we've, we've filtered basically 75% of our fish waste out of our water, um, assuming that our water is split evenly between our plants and our fish, right? So, um, you know, we, we can actually really keep that water fairly high quality uh, with split flow system, and we can operate everything under pressure, which is a really, really good deal. Um, under pressure irrigation. Uh, this is a biggie, um, and again, this one could almost be paired with split flow, um, but it, it allows us to blow things out. You know, I don't like low pressure systems. They're harder to operate. Biofilms end up fouling them. Uh, you know, something... Pipes clog easier. There's just there's just more problems by and large. Anytime we can operate under pressure, we're a lot happier. There's lower maintenance cost, and um, we have a little bit more flexibility in how we deal with problems in the system. So this is another thing that I always encourage people to think about. Try to get rid of your um, just gravity flow stuff. Now, if we're talking gravity flow from the point of irrigation through the drainage system back to the sump, that's inevitable. That has to be in every system for the most part. Um, if we're talking about gravity flow from the fish tanks through SLOs to, to, to our, through our filtration or, or our settlement tanks or whatever we have back to the sump, that's inevitable. That's going to be in any system, right? But as far as feeding those systems, we should always feed our subsystems under pressure. Low stocking densities um, is the fourth one on this list. And Low stocking densities, um, there's something that, that we use. Uh, we operate low stocked systems compared to other folks because we have a um, unique set of circumstances. Uh, here in the United States, in a lot of parts of the United States, 
we cannot sell live fish or it becomes kind of uh, we're, we're in a legal gray area selling live fish uh, because of invasive species concerns, because of uh, all these concerns. So, um, you know, you combine that with the fact that fish here is just not worth an awful lot for the most part. Um, you know, we've got imports from a lot of other places and consumers are not very sophisticated in how they approach fish as a product. Um, you combine all these things together and fish just isn't worth a whole lot. Honestly, it's not worth the trouble. So, you know, we've got about, so probably 600 to 700 pounds of fish in our system right now, um, which is higher. You will probably inevitably get back to me and say that's higher than I, uh, I typically recommend. And you're correct. Um, we are running our system a little bit uh, heavier stocking-wise than we normally do. Uh, we'll take some fish out at the end of the summer and have a fish fry. But um, the reality is, is most of the time we're operating at, at one pound for eight gallons is usually what I recommend max to one pound for 10 gallons on the low end. And uh, we'll operate a little bit higher than that, but our systems are pretty well designed and, and our fish are used to it and uh, things are kind of stable. But for most folks, of course, we, we recommend those lower stocking densities, at least here in the States, unless, unless you are in a place where fish, where you have the ability to grow a fish that you can sell live and get around some compliance issues, or you're in a place where fish has a really high value. And a lot of the times these are Asian markets and major cities where live fish um, are very valuable and uh, you can get great live weight uh, pricing. So... Um, you know, that's, that's the one, that's kind of an exception. Um, but by and large, you know, we, we do advocate lower stocking densities. And a lot of that reason is that, that we can uh, generate a lot more income off of our plants than we can off of our fish. Our plants are worth way, way more. I mean, to put this in perspective, you know, for fish, for, for tilapia, say you're raising tilapia, we might be able to get $2 a pound wholesale. I can get greens, uh, all right, I can sell my greens for, oh, at least $4 to $6 a pound wholesale, and I can grow those greens out. Um, that amount of, the, uh, you know, about six pounds and two and a half square feet in a month, and in 30 days, I can collect that money. I can clear that space, replant it. Um, with fish, I mean, I'm talking a year, 18 months, maybe 24 months to get it to market weight, and then I might yield a pound of meat, and there's all sorts of problems that could happen in the meantime, the payout is just, it's just not high enough for me to bother with it, if that makes sense. So in some instances, you know, in, in different markets, that's going to be very different. Maybe it's worth a lot more where you're at. Maybe it's worth the investment and the risk of, of carrying those fish for that long. Maybe it's worth the time and the energy and the headaches and the stress that come with being very focused on the fish production element of the system. But for us, that's just simply not the case. So for us, our fish are pets. They're, they're happy. They're colorful. They hang out all day long in our tanks. A lot of them are eight, nine years old. Um, and, uh, you know, they're, they're big old lunkers. And they just hang out. And we're okay with that because we make way more off of our plants than we ever could on fish. So um, that's kind of the, the reasoning behind our advocacy of low stocking densities for markets where produce is worth so much more than fish. At the end of the day, you know, um, you're going to make a lot of money on produce and you're not going to make as much money on fish, which again begs the question, you know, what is better than hydroponics or aquaponics? If you're just going to run your aquaponics system like a hydroponics system, you're not going to be selling fish. What is better? And that is an absolutely 100% legitimate question. And uh, I will definitely be talking about that in a later podcast. Um, high biological surface area. This is kind of a no-brainer. And there's not, you're never going to meet anyone online who says, you should have less biological surface area. Or if you do, you should run away as fast as you can, right? Um, everyone wants more biological surface area. The microbes are the heart and the soul of the system. So the more microbes you have in the system, the happier your fish will be, the happier your plants will be, the faster your, um, the faster your nitrification processes and mineralization processes are going to run, uh, the more response you can get from your system quickly. And this is a really wonderful thing. I mean, I love being able to feed my system aggressively on a nice hot day when my water temperatures are running high. I like to be able to feed my, my system very aggressively and, um, and see an immediate response. Um, and because, you know, we, we, 
run relatively low stocking densities, going back to the previous point. Uh, you know, all of our aeration is, is accomplished through circulation. We don't run separate aeration systems because if they fail, then you're hosed, right? Your fish die. So with our systems, you know, our, our stocking densities are low enough that we can have a power outage um, and, and our fish are fine. But it also means that we can feed them relatively aggressively for the amount of fish in the system. We have really great feeding rates because there's, you know, not a whole lot of competition. The, the, the fish are pretty happy. There's relatively high oxygen levels. And um, a lot of that food is processed pretty darn quickly. There's a lot of oxygen in that water. Um, so decomp starts quickly and all the mineralization processes that come with it. So we can feed our system and we see an almost immediate bump in ammonia. And then very shortly after that, we see nitrates start to rise. So we can actually change um, the the basically our nitrate readings in our system very quickly. Over the course of a few hours, uh, we can run up 30, 40 points even if we want. So um, having high biological surface area in our system uh, allows us to be really aggressive with how we approach kind of uh, the chemical balancing of the system, keeping our plants happy, treating deficiencies, that kind of thing. Um, now, that, that doesn't always happen. Uh, there's always problems. Don't get me wrong. I, don't, I never want to pretend like we've got a perfect system or that we've got it all figured out because we don't. But I will tell you that having a system that is really responsive because there's so much biological surface area in it is really a pleasure. And um, it gives you as the user a lot more flexibility in how you manage the system and how you get the most out of it. So those are the five things that are kind of core to what we do. If you've watched a lot of our videos and if you're familiar with our um, our system, then you know, of course, that there's a lot of other weird stuff that we do. Um, there's a lot of absolutely normal stuff that we do. Um, most of what we do is just taking the intelligent things that other people have figured out before us and applying them. Um, but we do have some kind of unique stuff that, that we figured out over the years. Um, but underlying all of that are these five points. You know, we always shoot for using a single pump if we can. Uh, we shoot for split flow systems by and large. We like to operate under pressure. We like low stocking densities, both for fish health, you know, aeration and uh, ease of use, and also kind of having a resilient system that won't uh, die if you lose power, something like that. And we like high BSA because it gives us a real responsiveness um, to feeding and to inputs and to all of these other things that we're doing in our system. So that's it. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of Aquaponics Academy um, on the fundamentals of our kind of system design philosophy. Uh, remember, this is just part one of two on the subject. So the next podcast, we're going to go into a little bit more detail um, kind of on the philosophy, uh, filling needs, and um, kind of more of like the, the considerations you should, you should take into mind when you're designing a system. Be sure to subscribe to our podcast on Stitcher or iTunes uh, for part two and more helpful aquaponics podcasts. And thanks so much for tuning in. We're really, really excited that you guys are listening to this and we hope that they're helpful to you.